Bienvenue to Swatten to Reporters here on France 24. I'm Mark Owen. Vladimir Putin still calls it a special operation launched on February the 24th to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine. That aim only Putin and his Axis support. Russia pretends to be the liberator both to the population of Russia itself and the Ukrainians whose land they've occupied. A propaganda machine that leads to extreme violence carried out by Russian troops on the ground. With evidence of war crimes mounting, an investigation of genocide has been opened by the Ukrainian prosecutors. Our reporter, Elena Voloshin, has been talking to the people in the land freed by Kyiv's army. Her report contains testimony that's hard to hear, but essential to understand fully what's happening in Ukraine. The stories of those who have escaped Russian occupation are all chillingly similar. Мы взяли тебя, кинули в подвал, сбили мешок на голову и бьют до тех пор, пока ты не скажешь что нацисты издевались над тобой и ты ждала Россию, хотя их нету, мы их не видели за 52 года. Stories of a reign of terror and a parallel reality imposed by Vladimir Putin's forces. Убивали специально людей и казали, что это украинцы. Брехали так, что это нельзя было выдержать. Тут люди лежали, мертвые, да. лежали, лежали люди, люди скрізь. Я просто не выдержала. Я говорю, зачем вы сюда пришли? Я говорю на украинском, а он говорит, говори со мной по-русски, говори со мной по-русски. Пропаганда from Russian state media collides with reality in the occupied territories. We did not come there to bring war, but to bring peace. We came there to free Ukrainians from calamity in the form of Nazis that have taken over the whole of Ukraine. This narrative is not new. Already in 2014, Russian propaganda was insisting that Ukrainian Nazis would ban the country's Russian speakers from speaking their language and would even commit genocide. We get asked how dangerous it is to be Russian today in Ukraine, more or less as dangerous as it was to be Jewish in Germany in 1933. We will defend our citizens with all the means we have available. Eight years later, Vladimir Putin begins what he calls the denazification of Ukraine. This was the scene in the woods outside Izum, a town in Kharkiv region, just under two weeks after its liberation. The Ukrainians had decided to exhume all the bodies buried here during six months of occupation. Around 450 individual graves, plus this one. From this pit, we exhumed 17 bodies of soldiers from the Ukrainian armed forces. One of them had his hands tied behind his back. The other graves are individual, but we found that some of them contained two or three bodies. Preliminary observations suggest most of these people were killed in shelling or by mines. But some bodies show signs of torture. The attention of a visiting delegation from Lithuania is drawn to this fractured skull. First off, we can say that it was a bullet that entered through the back of the head and went out through the side. We haven't found the feet. The hands were also separated from the body, which is wearing military fatigues. Demilitarization, the other war aim announced by Vladimir Putin. Jan, 20, experienced it firsthand when Russian forces entered his village. He lives with a foster family, with his grandfather, a forest ranger. 
They found Grandpa's compass and his forest ranger ID in his drawers. I'm also an apprentice ranger, and they found my camouflage uniform. They thought that Grandpa and I were targeters for the artillery. With bags over their heads and hands tied behind their backs, Jan and his grandfather were abducted, beaten and tortured. They ran a knife over my head. They said, we'll cut your fingers off, we'll cut your head off and play football with it. They threatened to cut my penis off. They brought a newspaper, set it on fire and burned me between my legs. They constantly repeated, you're a Nazi. I said, no, I'm not a Nazi. He said, shut up or I'll whack you in the teeth with my rifle butt. To them, all Ukrainians were Nazis. Having kidnapped Jan and his grandfather, the Russian troops moved into their house. The family cannot go back. It's in ruins, there's no house left. It can't be rebuilt. They took everything away, absolutely everything. The fridge and the washing machine were new. They liberated us, as they say, from our farms, from our homes, from our freedom. They liberated us from everything. The main thing was never to say the word occupation. It was totally banned. They were liberators. Yulia is all too familiar with this propaganda. In 2014, she fled Horlivka in Donetsk region after Russia took control of that part of eastern Ukraine. Russians broadcast their propaganda there, just as they did here in Kharkiv region during the occupation. Kharkov Z. Here, look. A nightmare since 2014. And there are the Nazis. That's how they saw us. From 2014, it was a nightmare. They banned people from speaking Russian. It's a lie. I still speak Russian today. Those who spoke well of Russia were beaten and kidnapped. It's a lie. I've lived here for eight years. I've never been beaten. Mostly, they're all fascists. That's it. Out of gross distortions of the truth, Russia has developed a whole mythology aimed not only at domestic public opinion, but also at occupied parts of Ukraine. The Nazis made a particular effort to destroy the Russian city of Mariupol, which rose up in 2014 against the Maidan coup d'etat. They gladly sacrificed it because this city does not belong to them, the nationalists. After the bloody conquest of Mariupol, also dubbed a liberation by Russian propaganda, the occupiers pose as heroes. Liberated Mariupol is a buzz with building works. The first priority is to clear the rubble in residential areas. Hundreds of rescuers have arrived from all over Russia. Mobile screens like this one have popped up in the streets of the city, broadcasting Russian television channels. When we first deployed a vehicle showing a news channel, there was a report about the liberation of the Azovstal factory and the return of peaceful life to Mariupol. People started clapping, their tears were flowing. That means that what we are doing is good. Back in the real world, in Izum, also devastated by shelling and airstrikes and occupied by Russia for six months, workers from the Municipal Education Department are returning to their office for the first time since the liberation. The office was looted and all the department's hard disks are gone. It's very sad. Everything was working so well. And now we'll have to start everything from scratch. This was the Education Department's accounting service. Most of the paper documents have been destroyed and all the computers dismantled. All the information is gone. I can't even imagine what we will have to do to restore all that. The staff have managed to retrieve just a few textbooks and other educational aids stored in this garage. They took all the books from our schools, all the Ukrainian textbooks that our kids used to study from. I suppose they wanted to bring in their own textbooks. Everything that was ours, they destroyed. They took it and simply destroyed it. We only managed to save a small part. Replacing Ukrainian textbooks and curriculums with Russian ones has been a priority of the so-called denazification campaign.
Добрий день. Victoria is a history teacher. She fled her occupied village north of Berdyansk this summer. Since then, with other colleagues in exile, she has been trying to continue teaching the pupils who stayed via clandestine online lessons. Today the occupiers go wherever they want. They can burst into the homes of whoever they want, check whatever they want, because they come with weapons. No one can say anything. They warn, they threaten, they ban things, delete things. In Berdyansk, they were confiscating digital equipment. There, there were also two teachers who, like us, were keeping Ukrainian school going online. They were kidnapped. Today, no one knows where they are. While we are filming, Victoria gets a call. That was our colleague. She's an English teacher. Another teacher was kidnapped by Russian soldiers two days ago. She says no one knows anything. His wife is in tears. They wanted to make him head teacher. Before fleeing her village, Victoria and her colleagues were summoned by the local Russian military leader. The occupiers had taken over the school and wanted them to work there. No one agreed. Yeah. Me. The soldier who checked us on the way out of the occupied territories, he also said to me, how can you ignore that? In Moscow, we've got documents in the library that prove that Ukraine would never have existed if it hadn't been for Lenin. That's how they treated us, as little Russians. Like we were part of the Russian Empire, like our state was created by Lenin, and like before that we only existed as part of the Russian Empire. This is a perfect expose of the negationist doctrine Vladimir Putin has dictated to Russian society. Ukraine has opened an investigation into alleged genocide and incitement to genocide, led by a prosecutor from the State Security Department. This is a copy of the cover of Armen Gasparian's book, The Denazification of Ukraine, the Land of Unlearned Lessons. This book is about how to exterminate Ukrainians. It conflates nationalism and Nazism and asserts that Ukraine is not an independent country, that we are not a nation or a people. In 2018, this book, published a year earlier, was officially purchased by the administration of the president of the Russian Federation. The Ukrainian investigators say the speech Putin made on the eve of the invasion is based on the genocidal ideology developed over many years. According to the expert's conclusions, he introduces incitements regarding a series of systematic violent acts aimed at depriving the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian nation of its own identity as a unique national group, of its own consciousness, and at depriving the Ukrainians of their national idea and their aspiration to statehood. Effectively, it calls for the annihilation of everything Ukrainian. And judging by the acts subsequently committed by the soldiers, these ideas have been put into practice. What is the real impact of this propaganda on the minds of the Russians who are fighting in Ukraine? We managed to speak to the head of a private military company under contract to the Russian Defense Ministry. He spent the six months of occupation in his room. That country is a prostitute, the whole nation. They're all like that, without exception, from the children to the very oldest. For everything they've done, all their scheming, for that, they will all be exterminated, will leave nothing but scorched earth. He flatly denies the abuses Russian forces are accused of, but vows revenge. They make up stories so you'll pity them, so they'll get money, humanitarian aid, so they'll be shown on TV. When we come back, we will do to them all those things they've been telling you about. No more Mr. Nice Guy, because when we're nice, they just don't get it.
Russians were so nice to Mikhail Fenich that he now needs therapy. The bullet went in through the side, it ripped and it went straight out. When Mikhail and his wife were fleeing their village, the occupiers opened fire on the convoy of civilian vehicles. There were corpses all along the road. No one was picking them up because they were constantly shooting. For over three kilometers, there were burned out cars and corpses. Helena, the psychotherapist, is employed by an American NGO. She's trying to help those who have escaped the combat zones and the Russian world's parallel reality. When someone humiliates and tries to kill a human being for a reason that has no grounding in reality, the person's mind needs to find an explanation. If the person has no access to other information, they have to seek the arguments for resistance within themselves. And with time, these internal resources will run out, and it gets harder and harder to resist. The beginnings, perhaps, of an explanation as to why Vladimir Putin's propaganda has such a strong grip on Russian minds. In the occupied territories, meanwhile, what is not accepted willingly is imposed by force. Wherever the Russians have been and left, there are innumerable accounts of war crimes. Elena Voloshin reporting. You can see her report again, of course, on our website, france24.com. Thank you for watching, reporters. Here on France 24, stay with us.